In the name of the one holy and living God. Amen. One day there was a traveler walking along a lane and he came across three stone cutters working in a quarry. Each stone cutter was busy focusing and cutting their particular block of stone. And he was interested to find out what they were working on. So he asked the first stone cutter, what are you doing? And he looked up and said, I am making a living. Well, that didn't really tell him much about what was being built. So he went to the second stone cutter and he said, and you, what are you doing? And that stone cutter replied, I am cutting this block of stone to make sure it is square and its dimensions are uniform so that it is the best stone in the wall. Okay, so he was still unclear and he went to the third stone cutter who seemed to be doing his work with joy. And he said, what are you doing? And that stone cutter looked up and smiled and said, I am building a cathedral. Three people, all engaged in the exact same task, all using similar gifts, but only one who works in joy sees his work as part of a much bigger picture. In his letter to the church in Corinth, Paul is addressing the proverbial stone cutters of his time, of his church. And it sounds as if he might be answering a question or maybe settling a dispute among them. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed, which certainly implies that they are, right? So it sounds as if, when you read the letter, that the people are in some ways in competition with one another over whose tasks, whose gifts are more important in the community. Instead of focusing on their proverbial cathedral, they are comparing all their stones and trying to rank the order of importance. Oh, comparison. I give you this handy little aphorism as you start the new year. Comparison is the thief of happiness. Ha ha, it's such a little gremlin. We do it all the time. We compare ourselves with people we know. We compare ourselves with people we don't. Famous people, models, people we would never even seek to be in relationship with. We compare our bodies. We compare our hair. We compare our clothes. We compare our careers to one another. We compare our educations. We compare our families, our family status. We compare our houses inside and out. We compare churches and styles of worship. We compare everything about our situations. We compare our accomplishments. And this saying that engaging in that comparison is a thief of our happiness rings true because rarely do we compare ourselves in a positive way. Usually we're comparing because we believe somebody else has it better than we do. And it certainly sounds like that's what's happening amongst Paul's church in Corinth. Or maybe they're doing the if only comparison. If only I had the spiritual gift of wisdom, or if only I had knowledge, if only I could do that, achieve that, look like that, have that, then, it would be all good. If only I could cut my stone like she does, then it would be better. Then I would be better than who I am right now. And that's the thief, believing we aren't worthy as we are. And that thief robs us of the gratitude for the gifts we have been given. Gratitude, which is what propels us to joyfully share those gifts with the world because we know they're a part of something bigger. That's the only reason that third stone cutter is happy. If we don't think our stones matter to the cathedral, then what's the joy in cutting them at all? What are the gifts God's given you to share with the world? What are the gifts God's given you to share with this community? This community wouldn't exist on Sunday or any other day if we didn't share 
with one another, our gifts. Do you think about what your spiritual gifts are? Do you get curious about what that might be? The ways in which all the spheres of your life connect through the gifts you've been given? Have you explored those gifts, perhaps new from prior years? How are you joyfully sharing who you are as part of the bigger picture? I mean, remember when you were pagan? What? There you are. We're not pagan. We're sitting here in church. But did you hear Paul ask that question? Remember when you were pagan. So let's define pagan in our time. It's when we look to the prevailing culture to set our values and our priorities instead of looking to God. I think it happens all the time, at least it does with me. Let's say last night, 8 o'clock, when I'm watching TV and I see an ad that makes me feel less than for one reason or another, or makes me covet something that I really don't need, or makes me think I'm better than someone else. That's what Paul's saying. Remember when you were pagan and you worshipped idols, the gods of wealth, the gods of beauty, the gods of status, gods that really aren't in relationship with you because they don't actually care about you as a person. They care about satisfying their needs and making sure you realize that your needs will never be satisfied. But you, brothers and sisters, have been formed of the Spirit, have been blessed by the Spirit, and are indelibly sealed and marked by the Spirit as Christ's own forever. Wow! What an amazing and glorious big picture, a picture of love and belonging and meaning and purpose. That's what the gifts and the talents are for. When was the last time you lost yourself in the middle of work, in the middle of doing something that truly engaged you in a conversation, in a task, in sharing with someone else when you came out of time? That is transcendence. That is communion. That is big picture connection. We who are many are one body, as Paul says elsewhere. That's what Paul is trying to say. This body of Christ is created when we come together to share and make this big picture alive in our midst, empowering and not ranking others with their gifts, but recognizing the mutual benefit of bringing in the kingdom. That's the activation of the spirit, Paul says. So I had this one illustration I was going to go on to, but then there was this news about the Episcopal Church. Maybe some of you heard it in the larger media. It was about not our church, but the big church, Big C, what we call the Anglican Communion. And it was in the news this week because across the pond, the Archbishop of Canterbury has called a primates meeting. Now, just as a very brief explanation, the Anglican Communion is comprised of 38 churches, such as the Episcopal Church in the United States of America. And each of these churches has a presiding or archbishop. Ours is Michael Curry. So periodically, the Archbishop of Canterbury, considered first among equals, calls together all of these leaders for a meeting. This is a gathering of our communion. And the gathering itself is called an instrument of unity because it is a sign of the big picture. Leaders coming together in common prayer to share their varied experience of living out the gospel of Jesus Christ in their context within their particular gifts. Now, many, us, many of us, myself included, believe a particular context and gifts of the Episcopal Church in our time and place is the prophetic vocation of inclusivity. Inclusivity not based on social theory or political leanings, but based on the theology of Jesus Christ as we interpret it through the scriptures. 
And I think it's a theology that can most succinctly be summed up in a well-known prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross so that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. The Episcopal Church lives into that sacramentally. We believe same-gendered couples are worthy to be married. We believe I, given who I am, am worthy to stand before you wearing this chasuble to consecrate the Eucharist. We believe that gay, straight, and lesbian people are worthy to be ordained. Now, not all of the 38 churches agree. So believing that relationship is always the priority, at this meeting, the Episcopal Church agreed to abstain from voting on ecumenical or interfaith matters of committees that were appointed by the communion. Which means, for all intents and purposes, it is a completely symbolic action with absolutely no real consequence in the day-to-day -day operations of this church or any of the churches in the Anglican Communion. So, all of that, because I don't want any of us to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, so when you read completely incorrect headlines from news media outlets, such as the egregious one I saw from the Washington Post that read, Anglican Communion suspends the Episcopal Church after years of gay rights debates, please know that is wrong. It is wrong because it is comparing and being simplistic and sensational. It's comparing the structure of the Anglican Communion to the structure of the Roman Catholic Church, a church that has a pope and a hierarchical structure based on doctrinal authority. But in the words of our presiding bishop, Michael Curry, the Anglican Communion is a network of relationships that have been built on mission partnerships, relationships grounded in a common faith, in companion dioceses throughout the world, relationships between parish and parish, parish to parish across the globe relationships that are profoundly committed to serving and following the way of Jesus of Nazareth by helping the poorest of the poor and welcoming the outcast. That's what the Anglican communion is, and the communion continues to move forward with that work. That is the big picture relational non-hierarchical illustration that Paul is proposing to his church in Corinth and to us here today. Because in our small and big picture way, we too are a beloved community brought together in relationship, activated by the Holy Spirit so that each of us can discern and share our spiritual gifts for the common good, the common good of this church and the common good of the kingdom of God in our world. So I hope in this new year, we commit ourselves to sharing and revealing bit by bit that kingdom made real when you and I find communion in sharing our gifts and our joy, gifts that God has given to every single one of us. Amen.